The views and opinions expressed on America's Workforce Union podcast and its digital media channels are solely those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the producers or sponsors. Welcome to the America's Workforce Radio Podcast, the flagship production of the American Workers Radio and Podcast Network, where organized labor and its never-ending fight to protect the rights of the American worker come first. Now, presented by LIUNA, Laborers International Union of North America, Here's your host, Ed Flash Ferens. The union component at the Democratic National Convention. It's all about winning back those rank and file members. Meanwhile, workers at Cornell on strike. And today on the show, we check in with Insulators Local 50 in Central Ohio and the president of the Kentucky AFL-CIO. Welcome to the Thursday, August 22nd edition of America's Workforce, where we're available on at least five platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. Dan Poteet will be our first guest on the show today. No stranger to America's workforce. He's working hard in central Ohio. They have, my gosh, about three dozen counties going from the eastern part of the state to the western part, right by the Indiana border. In fact, they have two counties in Indiana. Insulators50.com. We'll talk about the recruitment and organizing, which is delivering some results. We're talking heat and frost insulators. Central Ohio, as you know, pretty much on fire with all the building going on, especially in the Columbus area. So we'll get an update on that and more. And apparently they got a new CBA that they signed. So he'll give us some details on that. Then we're going to go to the state of Kentucky and check in with the new president of the AFL-CIO. Well, he's not that new. He was elected last year. That would be Dustin Reinstedler. A little background on Dustin. He started his union career in construction by joining a four-year apprenticeship program with the bricklayers and allied craft workers. That would be Local 4. And that was in 2005. He quickly became interested and engaged in his union went to a lot of meetings, was named recording secretary for the Louisville chapter of Local 4 when he was a second-year apprentice. How about that? Upon completion of the apprenticeship program, that was in 2009, he began supervising a lot of large industrial projects, overseeing up to 80 people at a time. Talk about a fast learner, huh? Upon the retirement of the past union rep, Local 4, hired Dustin, this was 10 years ago, in 2014 to replace Bill Clark as a union rep. Dustin also took on related duties like secretary treasurer to the pension, secretary treasurer to the drug safety and training fund. He was appointed by Governor Andy Bashir to the Housing, Building, and Construction Board of Kentucky and helped open new training schools in that state for future bricklayers. Four years ago, Dustin was elected president of the Kentucky State Building and Construction Trades Council, which represents tens of thousands of tradespeople in Kentucky. And last year, 2023, came his biggest honor to date, being elected by over 100,000 Kentucky union members to serve as president of the state AFL-CIO. So it's been uh, a quick climb. And we're going to talk about uh, how it's been since he took over from uh, Bill Londrigan. Bill Londrigan, uh, we've had him on the show many, many times. Those are those are tough shoes to fill. So uh, Dustin will talk about the transition there. Finding common ground with some Kentucky Republican lawmakers. You know that is not easy. Building labor solidarity. And recently, um, Dustin met President Biden. And uh, he's going to talk about Biden's legacy probably the most pro-union president in our history, more pro-union than FDR. I've said this many, many times because FDR was not a supporter of public sector unions. And Joe Biden is. The uh, website, by the way, is kyaflcio.org for the uh, Kentucky State Labor Federation. Now a brief look into the world of labor, the segment brought to you by Boyd Watterson Asset Management, $17 billion in assets under advisement. 
serving the needs of Taft-Hartley funds, corporations, public funds, endowments, foundations, as well as religious organizations. You can find more at boydwaterson.com. Leaders from several major unions spoke at the first night of the Democratic National Convention to express their support for Vice President Kamala Harris's presidential campaign. And what a lineup. It included AFSCME President Lee Saunders, SEIU President April Verrett, Brent Booker, General President of Labor's International, presenting sponsor of America's Workforce, IBEW President Kenny Cooper, CWA President Claude Cummings Jr., Sean Fain of the UAW, and the head of the AFL-CIO, President Elizabeth Schuler. Now, Schuler noted that Trump's policies were, as she put it, a CEO's dream, but a worker's nightmare. Fain, who appeared on stage supporting a Trump is a scab shirt, stated that Kamala Harris and Tim Walz have stood shoulder to shoulder with the working class where Trump and Vance represented, I love this, two lapdogs for the billionaire class who only serve themselves. Meanwhile, Teamster President Sean O'Brien, who spoke at the Republican convention last month, was absent from the DNC, and the Teamsters have yet to offer an endorsement to any party for the upcoming presidential race. We reported yesterday that Kamala Harris is trying to arrange a meeting with him. We don't have any details on that yet, but it is reported labor's large presence on the DNC stage seems to reflect the party's amplified efforts to win back rank and file union members who have shifted toward the Republican Party in recent years. Harris has been meeting with top labor leaders across sectors in hoping of cementing their support, and that will continue. Workers at Cornell University on strike this week, just as student move-in begins, the 1,200 workers going on strike include maintenance and facilities workers, dining workers, gardeners, custodians, agriculture, and horticulture workers. On top of that, the workers that are all represented by UAW Local 2300, they voted to authorize the strike by an overwhelming majority, 94% in favor. Christine Johnson was president of that local. Again, that's 2300 And she said that the current wage for most of her union members is less than $22 an hour, which is lower than the estimated cost of living for a family in Ithaca, New York. Now, in those talks, the university offered UAW employees a 17.5% increase in wages over four years and stronger health and personal leave. However, UAW leaders say, that the offer still does not amount to a living wage. The mayor of Ithaca, Robert Cantelmo, and other New York politicians have backed the UAW with public statements and by walking the picket line with the workers. So hats off there to uh, the politicians. Meanwhile, workers at the Sheraton Vancouver Airport, now these are members of Unite Here Local 40, They have ratified a new contract after striking for 14 months. The new three-year contract gives all workers a 30.5% wage increase, a return-to-work bonus, an increase in banquet workers' gratuities, transparency, and other tip protections, and new health benefits. More than 85% of the union members voted in favor of that new contract. Time now for another episode of Labor 130, and this is sponsored by our good friends at the National Labor Office at Blue Cross and Blue Shield, all to celebrate the 130th anniversary of Labor Day. Well, today, we focus on the National Labor Relations Board again, which formed back in 1935 as part of the National Labor Relations Act, often known as the Wagner Act. Richard Mack has represented public and private sector unions in litigation, grievance, arbitration, and negotiations. And this is part two of our three-part series on the National Labor Relations Board with Richard talking about how the Wagner Act paved the way for much better working conditions. So the Wagner Act 
was actually something that was needed to end the mayhem that was happening at these picket lines. There was a precursor, it was called the National Industrial Recovery Act, which had some of the stuff that's in the National Labor Relations Act, but not quite. That was struck down. So in 1935, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Democratic president from New York, saw the need, saw what was happening in the country, was putting together a package of bills called the New Deal, and unions lobbied to put the National Labor Relations Act as part of that package. And that's exactly what he did. For the first time, for the first time, these workers had the right to form a union. These workers could not be told, sign a yellow dog contract, renounce unionization. These workers had the right to demand that the companies bargain with them over wages, hours, or terms and conditions of employment. The employers had an obligation to sit down with the union and bargain in good faith over those things. And the important concept also was that it, of exclusive representation. So every lettuce grower, all custodians, all textile workers, every one of them was put in the same bargaining unit and told, you are now the voice of all of them. And when you sit at that bargaining table, you are the voice of every single office clerk, of every single street sweeper. And that was an important, important piece because it gave unions the strength and the leverage to make demands. And if things didn't work out, the right to strike was protected by federal law. Very, very important key piece. Interestingly, in the Wagner Act, that only provided for unfair labor practices against employers for violating one of these rights. So the act wasn't intended on mediating a dispute between employer and employee. It was intended on giving employees rights so that they wouldn't have to have as their first resort the picket line, but their first resort could be bargaining better wages, better conditions, benefits. Richard Mack, who has appeared on this show several times, often lectures for the Metro Detroit AFL-CIO, where his firm serves as general counsel. And you can find more on his firm at MillerCohen.com. This segment is brought to you by Blue Cross and Blue Shield's National Labor Office. Blue Cross and Blue Shield companies formed out of a need to provide affordable health care to teachers, to loggers, and miners. In 1965, the Blues developed the National Labor Office to strengthen its commitment to organized labor. And today, Blue Cross and Blue Shield's National Labor Office remains focused on America's workers, advocating for affordable and equitable health care. Partnering with strategic alliances to provide industry-leading products and services, and proudly serving more than 18 million unionized workers, retirees, and their families. All working hard for America's working families and for the health of America. You can learn more by following them at Blue Labor on LinkedIn and X, formerly known as Twitter. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, it's Dan Poteet, business manager of Insulators Local 50 in Central Ohio. This is America's Workforce. It takes Lyuna to keep America running. Over 70,000 public employees are part of Lyuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, delivering critical services such as health care and emergency response, as well as maintaining roads and sanitation systems. Even the National Postal Mail Handlers Union, representing over 47,000 U.S. postal workers, is affiliated with Lyuna. Find out what it takes for Lyuna to keep America running at lyuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. This segment of the show is brought to you by the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees Division of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. For more information, please visit bmwe.org. We're the nurses, firefighters, and claims representatives that help keep our government services running. We respond to natural disasters. We care for our nation's veterans, and we investigate discrimination in the workplace. We are federal and D.C. government workers, and we are proud to serve the American people. Working in more than 70 agencies across the government, we know we can fulfill our mission because our union has our back. Learn more at AFGE. Dot O-R-G. Paid for by the American Federation of Government Employees, AFL-CIO. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the United Steelworkers. You can find more at usw.org. 
Are you looking for a new health care partner for your union members? Let Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield be your champion, making sure your members live their healthiest lives now more than ever. It's important to have a partner you can trust, one who understands the unique challenges unions face. Anthem provides a variety of options to meet your organization's needs and helps you control costs without sacrificing quality of care. For more information, visit anthem.com slash labor and trust. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Iron Workers. You can find more at ironworkers.org. America's Workforce is sponsored in part by Boyd Watterson Asset Management, LLC. Find out more about our investment solutions tailored to meet the needs of Taft-Hartley funds at voidwaterson.com. Now, back to America's Workforce. Here's Ed Flash Ferens. And remember, you can check us out on Facebook or follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter. That would be AWF Union Podcast. Let's go to uh, line number one. Welcome our featured guest today. Good guy, working hard, growing his union. I'm talking about Insulators Local 50 insulators 50.com located in central ohio they actually merge with the uh, locals 44 and 79 so they got a big stretch in central ohio about uh, three dozen counties at least in two counties in uh, indiana lots going on in central ohio dan poteet welcome back to america's workforce so let's uh, let's get an update here on uh, on local 50 how we doing down there brother well, we're doing fantastic. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, we just settled our collective bargaining agreement, effective July 1st. Got a lot of exciting things going on, more work than we've we've ever experienced in the past. Well, let's get into some details. I remember talking to you. In fact, you were very hard to get, and for good reason. I mean, you were working on that CBA. What can you, uh, what can you tell us about it? Well, um, we got the largest monetary increase we've ever gotten. We got some um, some wording in our collective bargaining agreement to protect against some of these double-breasted employers um, from being able to perform work in our jurisdiction with their non-union arm. Uh, that that was really important to us. Um, Wage-wise, we we pulled uh, eleven over three, uh, three forty-five the first year, three ninety-five the second year. 365 the third year um but the the big thing we got in there was um every march we have a medical increase so that this coming march the employers will cover a hundred percent of that that's anticipated to be 75 cents uh so now the members won't lose that off their check uh the second year will be uh, 75 percent and uh third year will be 50 percent of the medical increase so so when you include what the anticipated medical increases are um we pulled 1269 over three in our zone one uh we were able to eliminate our zone two um and the members working in zone two got a 14 dollar and 55 cent increase um so that, that was a huge deal we got our apprentices um back into our pension the first and second years pay 50 percent of the contribution rate um, and the third and fourth years pay 75. Uh, we seem to be able to turn that just the opposite of what a lot of locals are doing right now it seems to be a fad to reduce apprentice benefits um, to get more on their check well we were able to get more on their check uh, and increase their benefits so um, I, I got to give some kudos to the employers as well for understanding the need uh, for recruitment and the recruitment of good people. Yeah. And, yeah. and the need to retain uh, the membership that we have. So, you know, it was, it was a pretty good collective bargaining agreement session. That's awesome. Really good. Congratulations on that. What, for the sake of our listeners, maybe you can explain, you mentioned zone one and zone two. Can you, can you help me out on that? Yeah. So, when we merged, we merged in 2006. Zone one was the former local 44 or Columbus, Ohio local. Zone two was the local 79 Dayton, Ohio local. Um, when we merged, they, they left us with two separate pay rates, two zones. Um, and we've been working uh, pretty hard since the merger to 
try to bring those to one rate. And, and with this agreement, we were able to do so. Uh, starting July 1st, we are now just local 50s jurisdiction. There is no more division of where you're working or where you're living. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, we try to spread it around, make it as uh, as even as possible. And I know that was a very difficult task. Again, that's why we couldn't get a hold of you because you were working hard on this. Well, again, congratulations on that. You can put that behind you. Let's let's talk about the work because I know there's a lot of work going on in Central Ohio. Maybe you can spell it out for us. Oh, sure. Um, there's and it just keeps adding every day, right? Um, I think I sit in more pre-job meetings now than I do anything. We have obviously we have that big medical tower that's running at OSU. Um, we have a powerhouse starting supposed to be first week of September. We have a a diesel engine plant in Brookville, Ohio that's supposed to start the first week of September. Um, I think we have 42 active data centers. Um, there's another 60 that are projected to come. We have, uh, of course, the battery plant uh, that's starting to ramp up. Um, I spoke with Intel early this week. Um, it looks like second quarter of next year we'll be manning that job up. Um, and, and those are just the the highlight jobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a two point we have a two point one billion dollar blast furnace job coming to Cleveland Cliffs in Middletown, Ohio. We have. The amount of work is just endless, and and I don't think you want me to spend the rest of your day just listing jobs, but it's incredible. Um, it's, it's great for the workers in Ohio. It's great, more specifically, for the members of Local 50. It's just really exciting times right now. Dan, you can talk about jobs all you want, my brother. That's what this show is all about. We want to make sure that there's plenty of jobs out there, and not just jobs, good union jobs. And obviously, this is uh, Heat and Frost Insulators Local 50, and these are good union jobs, and you got that new CBA. So that that's awesome. I, I love that. Yeah, Cleveland Cliffs, I've been following them, and uh, it's too bad that uh, they weren't the uh, the main player in that uh buyout with U.S. Steel, and it's been kind of quiet. I I think something might happen here. I'm just speculating right now, but that's a really solid company for workers. Good relationships with the steel workers. Obviously, you're going to have a good relationship with them, so uh, I'm definitely going to follow that one. Okay, with all these jobs, you got to crank up, and what are you, how many members? You're over 200, 225, or something like that in Local 50? Yeah, we're we're right at 225 members now. Um, our apprenticeships up to 72 members, uh, 72 apprentices. Um, we're we're running a, a recruitment campaign and organizing campaign through BMA. Um, I can't say enough good about them. They're extreme professionals. Um, the international has been extremely helpful, sending us leads and giving us. Uh, some new platforms to work off of. So yeah, we're just, we're growing. We're in full recruitment mode. We've, we've organized four or five people in the last two weeks, you know, which is always helpful. It, there's nothing like finding a guy with experience and being able to change not only his life, but, but his family's life by offer him, offering them better benefits and higher wages and uh, just some more security. So, yeah, we're definitely growing. Things are things are really looking up here. Let's talk about reaching out. You and I have had a number of conversations here on America's Workforce about getting women, people of color into the trades as part of your recruitment campaign. Is that happening, Dan Poteet? It is without a doubt happening. Um, we have some some phenomenal members that are that are minorities. We're getting ready to go to the women's build or the trade women build nations conference. We're sending two of our younger apprentices with our JATC coordinator. Um, it just a lot of exciting stuff. Um, a lot of exciting stuff. We're partnered with BMA again. They're helping us recruit women and minorities. Um, we're trying to get with a Latino group in Columbus, Ohio, um, to reach out that way as well. This is just really great for all working people. Um, everyone deserves the same opportunity and the same benefits when they're out there working. Yeah. 
Well, like you said, there's a lot of work out there, and we gotta we gotta fill those positions. Uh, as far as retaining, especially women, you know, with childcare issues and all that, I, I've had I've had this conversation with almost every local that we've talked to on the show. How are we doing with uh, Insulators Fifty on that? Well, this is going to be an unpopular thing to say, but um, we do better with retaining women than we do with some of the young men that are coming in now. Um, most of these women that are coming in, they, they come in and, and they must just feel like they have something to prove because they are incredible workers. They're incredible members. They want to be involved. Uh, they're insightful. Uh, they participate. Uh, so re- we have not had a problem with retention. That's amazing, Dan. Um, any idea why that's happening? What do you attribute that to? I attribute it to, uh, we have a couple of uh, really solid journeyman uh, women members, um, and they're just incredible mentors. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to place some of our our new women with those ladies, and, and they've They've just been so helpful when it comes to retention and helping them understand uh, how to operate uh, in the construction industry and and how to be involved and and it's just been wonderful. I I can't give enough praise to um, our sisters of this local. Well, Dan, that's really good to hear. And the other component in this, and you've probably seen the cost of higher education. It's ridiculous today, and when you when you're done with that, you don't have the job to pay off the student loans. So obviously, there's a lot more interest in the trades. And uh, do you see? Do you see? As far as like going into the high schools down there, is that message getting across? Saying, "Hey, you know what? There's a lot of opportunities right now here at Local 50." Is that pretty much happening, Dan? Yeah, I think the message is without a doubt getting out. You know the. When you leave, uh, if you go to college, when you leave college, you have all this debt. You're you're hoping to find a job. When you come into the trades, these young people are seeing they're going to come in. They're going to start fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year. They have no debt. They're they're learning a, a skill. They're learning a trade that they're going to be able to provide for themselves and start a family. Uh, and when they're done with the apprenticeship, there is no debt. Uh, they're just making more money. So, yeah, I I definitely believe that message is getting out. All right. We'll leave it on that note. Dan Poteet, business manager of Insulators Local 50 in Central Ohio, insulators50.com, 225 strong and growing. And I mean growing. I'm going to let you go. You take care. Stay in touch. Okay, brother? Thank you very much. You have a wonderful day. All right. I am going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to go to the state of Kentucky, check in with the president of the AFL-CIO. Back in a few minutes, you're listening to America's Workforce. You're listening to America's Workforce with Ed Flash Ferrens. Are you an experienced mechanical insulator looking to take your career to the next level? Insulators Local 50 in Central Ohio has steady work for a number of years. Insulators Local 50 offers a total wage and benefits package that can't be beat. It's not just the competitive wages. Local 50 also provides medical, vision, and dental insurance with no paycheck deductions for you and your family. Don't miss out on the chance to secure your future. Join us at Insulators Local 50. Earn great pay and the best benefits. Visit insulators50.com forward slash AWF50 to fill out the online form and a local 50 representative will call to begin the process. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Communication Workers of America. You can find more at cwa-union.org. There is unity and strength for workers. We are the USW. We are the USW. The The United United Steel Workers. Workers. The largest industrial union in North America. We represent 850,000 members in In the the US, US, Canada, Canada, and and the the Caribbean. Caribbean. We work in metals, rubber, chemicals, paper, oil refining, atomic energy, and the service sector. We are steel workers, standing strong and fighting for what's right. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers. You can find more at ifpte.org. 
It takes Lyuna to power North America with affordable energy. The men and women of Lyuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, have the skills needed to build and maintain oil, natural gas, nuclear, solar, and wind projects that are shaping America's energy future. From new energy tech to retrofitted facilities, Lyuna members do it all. Find out what it takes to be powered by Lyuna at Lyuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. America's Workforce Radio is sponsored in part by the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, District Council 6, representing painters, glazers, drywall finishers, and sign and display industry workers. They remind you that belonging to a union is your right as an American. Now, back to Ed Flash Ferrance with America's Workforce. And remember, you can check us out on at least five platforms. That includes Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. And when you get an opportunity, here's what you do. Just sign up and receive our shows on a regular basis and give us a rating. We always appreciate those five-star ratings, so please keep them coming. By the way, this uh, next segment brought to you in part by the United Labor Agency. ULAgency.org is a website. Let's go to the state of Kentucky and welcome to the show a newcomer. He became president of the Kentucky State AFL-CIO last year. KYAFLCIO.org is their website for uh, complete information. His name is Dustin Reinstedler. Dustin, welcome to America's Workforce. I know you're a fan of this. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Let's start off right there. Oh, you did. Nice work. Okay, thank you, thank you. I was reading your uh, background at the beginning of the show, and I'd like to hear it from you. And what really impressed me was how quickly you became interested and engaged in your union. So we're going back, uh, what is it, almost 20 years, 2005? Absolutely. The uh, Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers, Local 4. Talk to me about that time in your life and why. Now, do you come from a union family? Let's start right there. I do. I do. So that's, you know, that really gave me the old, uh, you know, kickstart. So, uh, you know, being raised in those kind of households and, you know, having that kind of family, um, certainly doesn't hurt, but, uh, yeah, I come from a, a lo- pretty much a long line of, of union family. I have a great grandfather that uh, came over here around 1910 from Germany. Uh, you know, like, uh, many immigrants, I uh, was looking to, uh, better himself and and a family and you know be a part of the american dream join the carpenters union um his sons were union carpenters i have uncles that were um in union um you know aunts that were in unions um so pretty good family history ever since we uh, came across the pond now why did you uh, choose the bricklayers a good question uh, so i do i do come from i do i do come from a long line of of union carpenters uh and other uh you know jobs but uh i had a great uncle and when i was a young man and i and i knew that i needed to get serious about life and and join a trade and an apprenticeship i went and saw him and it it really just so happened he said go see Bill Clark, he's the union rep over there at the Bricklayers. I just heard they were looking for apprentices. And that's, I just went there and showed up and, you know, that it, it all happened so fast that I had no chance to turn back, you know? Uh-huh. So getting involved in the union happened very, very quickly. Talk to me about that. Okay. So, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm young. I, uh, of course, had done, messed around with a little construction uh, just from helping family members out with projects or whatever else, uh, you know, and so never had done it as a job or anything, but, uh, went down there and, um, you know, I knew, I knew I wanted to do something. Um, and I did have a great deal of respect for masonry, obviously. I mean, uh, brick block and stone, it, it stays there for a long time. And I think that's really cool. I also like the, uh, artistic aspect of masonry. You know, people tend to admire, uh, what you build and you can step back and look at something, uh, you know, for years to come. But, uh, so, you know, I go down to the union hall, uh, introduce myself, and he says, oh, Ryan Stedler, what the, what the heck do you want to be a bricklayer for? You can have a maid over at the Carpenters, you know? So, uh, you know, I just told him, I said, look, I really actually like masonry. It's, it's interesting to me. Uh, went through that whole deal, and uh, he basically said, when can you start? And I think that was like a Thursday afternoon, and they had me starting Monday morning, you know? Uh, 
So I, I joined the apprenticeship. Uh, they send you to what's called a pre-apprenticeship school. So they sent me up to a training center uh, from Louisville to Indianapolis uh, for, it's typically a 12 week program. I think I finished in nine weeks. Uh, basically they just, they give you the basics of how to handle a trial, how to use your mortar, you know, develop your basic techniques to where you can actually go on a job site and, uh, you know, make a paycheck. So, uh, from there, it's a four year apprenticeship where you go one day a week to class and the rest of your training's on the job and you progress with your wages, uh, every six months, you know, as long as you're meeting your hourly requirements and class time requirements and all that. Um, but man, I'm telling you, um, as, as far as the apprenticeship, I, I couldn't ask for a better situation. Um, uh, it, it's kind of one of America's best kept secrets are, are union trade apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. Um, you finish debt free, you finish debt free. They, they typically buy your tools. They give you job placement. Uh, your apprentice instructor is not only a guy that's a man or woman that's teaching you, but oftentimes they're also kind of a counselor and they help you through uh life situations and you know just good advice good people to be around good network um but uh i was lucky to have that good network um within the bricklayers i really have to give credit to you know several people and i won't take the time to list all the names they definitely know who they are but uh including the past union leader here in louisville kentucky um they really had open arms for not just me but anyone that wanted to get involved in union activities from uh, union meetings to showing up to rallies, to going to Frankfurt, uh, our, our state capital, to lobby uh, legislators. Uh, very early on, I was really interested in all that stuff. I, I was amazed at the power that workers had collectively. Um, it, I mean, it just always excited me. Um, so anytime they made an announcement that there was some kind of activity going on, I, I was there if I could be. Yeah. Well, obviously at local four, they saw something in you that you probably didn't even know you had. And you, you went right up the ladder. That's cool. I see about four years ago, you were elected president of the Kentucky state building and construction trades council. And then last year you're elected to the Kentucky state labor federation. That that's quite a climb. Uh, going back to Local 4, how is Local 4 today? How many members there? How are they doing over there? Local 4 is holding steady. Um, you know, I, uh, we're in, Local 4, Indiana, Kentucky, which is all of Indiana and, and a good chunk of Kentucky, uh, basically straight down the middle of the state and to Tennessee, all the way over to the west. Um, now, I know a lot more about Kentucky as I was, uh, you know, in charge of that Kentucky chapter. Um, we uh, had just about doubled our membership um, in in the time that I was there as the bricklayer rep, and we opened two brand new training centers while I was there, um, where previously we had none in, in two of those cities, uh, Bowling Green and Louisville. Um, those are those are thriving. Um, we've you know signed contractors from using all top down methods uh, just to be able to show. Well, what we offered as a union, as far as the uh, skilled and trained workforce, uh, safety stuff, uh, we had attempted some bottom-up organizing, but as you know, with the NLRB challenges and, and, and so on, it was exactly that. It was a challenge, uh, but top-down seemed to be the way that, that worked for us there. Yeah. Well, th that's a tough state there. I mean, it's a right-to-work state. Your legislature is uh, pretty much all Republican, but... You have a very good governor by the name of Andy Bashir, and you were telling me before we started this conversation, boy, what a change from the previous governor. Yeah. Talk to me about what the previous governor did to workers. I mean, it's horrible. Well, you hear about, you know, night and day, right? I'm going to tell you that uh, you're you're speaking of Matt Bevin, the Republican governor that came in last term. Uh, yeah. But it, we really went we really went from day to night to day. So. Uh, before Matt Bevan, we had Steve Bashir, which is Andy Bashir's father. He was a two-term Democrat, uh, very pro-labor, great governor. You know, the old Trump train came to town in Kentucky, and Matt Bevan was elected. And literally day one, and I mean, you know, they were not shy about this. Uh, labor was in the crosshair. So um, House Bill 1, Senate Bill 1, uh, top priority. And in fact, they even called an emergency session as soon as he was sworn in. Uh, were to pass right to work, repeal pre prevailing wage, and you know several other 
uh, you know, down issues that also affect workers. Um, so yeah, we had, we had a horrible four years, um, with Matt Bevan. And even though we have a very red state and, uh, of course, super majority of Republican house and Senate in Frankfurt, I just think people in general were sick of Matt Bevan. They were sick of all the, uh, corporate greed that he brought along with them. And it was, it was a huge power and money grab while he was here. Um, they tried to privatize everything. And, uh, you know, the Bashir family stepped up and Andy ran and uh, he, he won, uh, you know, pretty well. And then he was just reelected for a second term and, and won by an even larger margin against a handpicked uh, Trump and Mitch McConnell candidate. Now, the legislature, no change, though, not even a, a few more worker friendly candidates on board, or is it pretty much the same? Uh, no, no, actually, we we lost a couple seats. Uh, Democrats did. So that that really speaks highly of Andy Bashir. Really, uh, yeah, uh, lost a couple seats. So it went even more red. Uh, but we were able to reelect a, a Democrat governor. If you can yeah. do the math on that. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But uh, Andy's been Andy's been great. Let me tell you, I, I meet with him in person monthly. Um, I mean, he, he cares about labor so much that he wants to hear what we have to say, what he can do to help. Um, it's, it's always a hundred percent, uh, you know, what do we need to be doing better to help working class people? Now, speaking of the governor, I see, I saw this in your bio. Um, he appointed you to the housing building and construction board of Kentucky. Was that when you were the head of the building trades there? It was right around the time when I became uh, president of the Kentucky state building trades council, I was appointed and, it was quite an honor, and I really enjoy serving on that board for the state of Kentucky. Good stuff. You know, Dustin, i got to take a quick break here. Dustin Reinstedler joining us on our live line today. He is president of the Kentucky State AFL-CIO, kyaflcio.org is a website. We'll continue with him right after this. This is America's Workforce. It takes Lyuna to build North America's infrastructure. From roads and bridges to schools and skyscrapers, the men and women of Lyuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, build the projects we depend on. From constructing the Freedom Tower on the site of the former World Trade Center to untangling Washington, D.C.'s congested interstate, Lyuna members do the work that matters. Find out what it takes to be built by Lyuna at lyuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Heat and Frost Insulators Labor Management Cooperative Trust. Find out more at insulators.org forward slash LMCT. America's Workforce appreciates our sponsor, the Columbus Central Ohio Building and Construction Trades Council, who represents more than 18,000 workers from 19 affiliated local unions and district councils. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, where you can find more at teamster.org. Founded in 1887, the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees Division of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters represents the employees responsible for tirelessly constructing and maintaining the national rail system in America. For more than a century, the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees has proven they have what it takes to protect its members and meet the ever-changing challenges of the rail industry. Today, the BMWED continues to fight for job security, fair wages, better benefits, and safer, more modern work environments. For more information, please visit bmwe.org. America's Workforce is presented by the Labor's International Union of North America. Feel the power right now at liuna.org. This portion of the show brought to you by the International Union of Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers. For more information, please visit bacweb.org. This is America's Workforce. More shows available at awfradio.com. And remember, you can check us out on Facebook or follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter. That would be AWF Union Podcast. By the way, this next segment brought to you in part by the Ohio Federation of Teachers, oh.aft.org. We had Melissa Cropper, president of the OFT, on the show a couple of days ago. If you missed it, awfpodcast.com is where to go for all of our shows. Let's go back to our live line and rejoin Dustin Reinstedler, who is president of the Kentucky State AFL-CIO. Got that position last year following the footsteps of Bill Laundrigan. Bill was a 
great contributor to America's workforce, Dustin. I, I know you had a lot of respect for him. I remember, uh, yeah, it was a lot of flooding there a couple of years ago. And like labor does, they came to the rescue and they he put together a team of people and helped. Oh, my God, I think it was like 10,000 people that were really suffering due to the uh, flooding in a certain part of Kentucky, which floods a lot over there because of this uh, crazy weather that we've been having over the past couple of years. I want to get back and talk about the uh, the legislature. And you were talking about how difficult you got a very pro-worker Democrat governor, but a Republican legislature. And your previous governor, you mentioned what he, he took you right to work, dump prevailing wage. And, and also, I guess he kind of cut back on OSHA. What what do we know about that? I mean, this it's amazing what what one person can do. We always say elections matter. Talk to me about what what happened. So we're talking about worker safety that was compromised in the state of Kentucky, right? That's correct. It was um, it was like I said, it was one hundred percent a power and money grab. Um, and of course, people that uh, see these things and pay attention in other states, um, the moment we knew that Matt Bevin was going to run for governor we knew that if he was elected all these things would happen so um once they get their foot in the door once they get elected there's no stopping it i mean um i gotta tell you you can you can fight all you want and we certainly do fight we always will fight no matter what um but when you have a super majority uh of their own party behind them uh they just come in and they call emergency sessions they do um exactly what they want and that is to uh serve the the wealthy, um, you know, their special interest people. Uh, they certainly do not care about the working class people. So um, to really to just be blunt with you, they exactly came in and uh, laid off or fired um, state OSHA inspectors. Um, I, I want to say they cut 75% of the OSHA staff, uh, like right around day one. So, you know, you, 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 we've got a pretty large state geographically, and it takes from east to west, I, I believe it's six and a half, seven hours from one side of the state to the other, uh, and probably uh, three and a half hours north to south. So, um, as you can imagine, uh, what that does is, you know, a worker may have a complaint um, or, or maybe there's a violation or an injury. Um, and it, it just backlogged everything. We're, we're not talking about where somebody can get there in six or seven hours. We're talking about things went, um, immediately to weeks behind to months behind, uh, as far as the word class people getting any kind of help from the state. Again, that was the previous governor. Now you got Andy Bashir, but again, a super majority GOP legislature. And and I've had various conversations with people in your position. And the, the whole issue here, you got to try to try to find some common ground. And I understand there was some legislation that you were able to suppress bad legislation for workers and maybe a few good things. What, what can you tell us about that, Dustin? That's right. We, um, it, it really is common ground is really what you have to do. Um, so, you know, I'd like to tell you that, you know, Andy Bashir, although he's a great, uh, pro labor Democrat governor, he can only do so much. He can, he can appoint people to run cabinets, which he's done. Uh, and he's communicated with us, uh, before and during. Um, but as far as the legislature goes, uh, legislature goes, they still have complete control over budgets and, and things like that. So, um, when it comes to legislation, however, uh, earlier this year, we had a, a, a pretty long session. It was a budget session. Uh, and although they were focused on uh, budget issues, we still had some pretty wild characters coming out with some pretty anti-worker bills. Um, House Bill 500 is the big one that stands out. They were uh, proposing to take away uh, breaks, lunches, overtime pay, uh, travel pay. Uh, it was, I'll be honest with you, it was a 21-page bill just full of uh, anti-worker agenda stuff. Amazing. Um, so, you know, we quick, it, it was amazing. Uh, so we quickly took that and immediately put it out to all of our affiliates, all over our social media. We, uh, you know, we have a call to action network. So we opened up the, the text lines, the email lines, the, the call lines straight to the state house. Um, 
And I want to tell you, I, I really have to brag on this and our affiliates and the way we pulled together in solidarity. Our our previous record was when Matt Bevan was here in Right to Work and Friendly Wage Game. We had around 6,000 um, call to actions to the state house, uh, you know, to get people to, set, to to contact their lawmaker and tell them to stop this. Um, this year with this House Bill 500, we had over 12,000. So we actually doubled that. Uh, previous record. I mean, uh, people were fired up about the idea of losing their breaks and lunches, you know? Uh, so what we did there, there were a few other, there were some child labor uh, bills that came out. They wanted to lift federal uh, protections, safety protections on uh, 15 and 16 year olds. So uh, in other words, you could put a 15 year old in a bucket truck and have them chainsaw on near power lines. Um, you know, that's, that's the kind of activity these people had on their agenda. Um, so we took all that energy and momentum from the house bill 500. And every time they came out with, with another bill, we were contacting those same people saying, Hey, please make another call. Please send another email. Now there's this, whatever. Um, and we were able to beat back every single thing. The only thing we actually lost on, uh, this year was the autonomous vehicles. Uh, which was House Bill 7, um, but we were able to uh, get it amended kind of at the 11th hour. We got a two-year human operator amendment put on that bill. Um, and, and as you mentioned a second ago, we did pass some positive uh, legislation also. We got a uh, pretty cool, we got a guidance counselor bill is what we're calling it. But, um, you know, guidance counselors, we all know that they push kids towards college and they rarely talk about the trades and, and this, it's been kind of a problem across America where they're taking away vocational schools and they're not really focusing on uh, kids working with their hands and that sort of thing. Um, so what this bill did, um, it requires uh, guidance counselors to have four to six hours of accredited training per year, which I think they have to have 20 hours each year uh, of some kind of training. Uh, and what they do is they actually will come to a uh, building trades apprenticeship uh, anywhere in the state and spend four to six hours shadowing and learning about the program uh, so they, they can better direct, um, you know, high school kids towards the trades. Dustin, great to hear. Dustin Reinstedler, who is president of the Kentucky State AFL-CIO, joining us on our live line today. Dustin, we got a little bit of time left here. I was reading earlier that you met President Biden. I guess this is when you were head of the uh, Kentucky State Building Trades. Um, how did that go? I mean, that's that's pretty cool, meeting the president of the United States, a very pro-union guy. How, uh, how was that for you? It was amazing. I mean, the experience of a lifetime, definitely uh, easily to say the, the best union experience I've ever had. Uh, I've, I've done some amazing things in my career and met awesome people, but it, it doesn't get much better than Joe Biden. Uh, we were able actually to stand there, shake hands, talk for, you know, probably four or five minutes. It feels like 20, uh, you know, but he, he was so down to earth. He was, he was cussing. He was talking about construction. I mean, uh, Joe gets it. He's he's the man. Yeah, yeah. Not afraid to say the word union. Much like the uh, the current nominee here, you're pretty excited about what's uh, what's what's happened at the DNC this week. Oh my gosh, it's been awesome. I've been I'm so tired. I've been staying up late every night watching all that, um, and it's just uh, it's exciting. It's great to see all this energy. And day one, uh, I'm going to tell you um, if you don't know if you watch that and you don't know that workers are the priority of the Democrat party, then, then you weren't paying attention because that was the focus of the first day of the convention. Uh, you saw all those great union leaders get, get up and give great speeches. You heard every politician saying the word union, um, you know, left and right over and over. Um, I just think it's, uh, it's time for workers to come together and realize that there is a party that cares about their best interests. And we will leave with that. Dustin Reinstedler, president of the Kentucky State AFL-CIO, kyaflcio.org. She's a website. Great job today. Keep in touch with us, okay, brother? Okay, thanks a lot. I appreciate everything you guys are doing up there. And that'll be it for another edition of America's Workforce. Coming up tomorrow, the Valley Labor Report and the United Steelworkers. Until then, all of you have a safe and wonderful day. That concludes another episode of the America's Workforce Radio Podcast. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe so you never miss a show. 
America's Workforce is a production of Labor Tools and BMA Media Group. Find out more information online at labortools.com.